how about you, Zane? How are you? Uh, not too bad. I had like five interviews last week. Four out of five where it went well. But I hate the process that they have to do like 10 rounds for, you know, before they give you an offer. Like screening first, then you talk with this guy, then you talk with this guy, then you talk with this guy. There were like five people in the call. Everybody was happy with Freddy. And like, he was a good fit for the company and everything. And at the end, I told them like, hey, so, you know, I'm an international student. I can, like, we can sit down in an afternoon. We can do this process, uh, you know. I can help out. I've been researching about it. I know what's the process like, and I can pay for it. Like I, I can do like all of it. Like you just, you guys need to sign it. And then one of the HRs that was there, like she was happy, and instantly the face changed to like a serious face. Like you could have seen like the super radical change. It was like. No, we don't do that because of the complexity of the process. In my mind, I was like, dude, I, I just said that it was super easy and we can just do it. And like that awkward moment when there's like six people in the call then, you know, like it happens. Mm -hmm. Well, four out of five is better than one out, one of, out five, of five. So. So. <laughs> like one of them, they were honest with me and they were like, you know, we have done it in the past. You know, that's something that like we get we can talk to we don't know if this year we're doing it but we're gonna ask and we'll get back to you guys. i think we have four interviews and that's probably one more than we actually need we have a couple of rounds of questions we've got like a 19 step process but our people end up staying with us for four or five years at least if not longer so i think we've got a pretty good setup i think one of the things you see with companies nowadays is nobody actually wants to make a decision and everybody's scared and everybody's worried they're going to mess up, hire the wrong person, so they never hire anybody. And they end up taking so damn long that the people that they actually wanted to hire already had 12 job offers and have moved on with their life. If you can't make a decision in the first meeting with them that, yeah, we're going to hire them or no, we're not, then what are you doing? Like, you need to get different people in there. You need to get HR out of the way and you need to get the actual hiring managers and the presidents and the owners and people like that talking to people. That's the steps our process goes. Like we have an ad on LinkedIn and you click on that and it takes you to a landing page. And in that landing page is a bunch of video of us and explanations of our company and what we do and what's going on. So you already have a whole lot of information to make sure you actually match, right? Now, most of you guys will just click apply and hope, but Hopefully some of you are listening to some of the things that I'm saying on YouTube and you're actually coming after us, right? Because we're the company you want to work for. And if that's the case, this is perfect, right? Well, you fill out your stuff and then we automatically send you a list of impossible ask questions. You know, like things like, what's your why? Well, you don't get asked that in an engineering interview, right? What's your why? I mean, hell, most of us don't even know. We ask a bunch of really hard questions. And if you get through that, then you, then you get a quick technical interview. It's super quick. You know, 20 minutes, we'll know immediately whether you can do shit or not. And if you can't, then we'll say, hey, study this and hit us up in a year. And if you can, cool, we're going to get you scheduled with somebody to talk through the actual job. Like, what's the job? What are you going to do? What's the accountability chart? What are you responsible for? Who are you working with? How do you fit into the company? All that kind of stuff, right? And if that all goes well, then our next step is we have you talk with one of our people in the area that you're going to work in. So like one of your co potential coworkers, right? And that way we get a feel for, you can ask, you know, questions of them about the actual work. Like, hey, show me what you're doing. Show me what you need to know. Show me what you didn't know. Like, what do I study? How do I get ready? All that kind of stuff, right? And then if that goes and you don't get, you know, black flagged or, hey, this guy's crazy or any of that kind of stuff, then, then you have a final interview with me, the president, so we can work on culture, right? Do you fit the culture in both directions, right? Are we the right company for you? And are you the right person for our company? Because both of those needs to match. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of interviewing and HR and companies that are hiring people is you don't find the culture match. They hire the technical fit, but someone that doesn't fit the culture or vice versa. You got to get both for it to fit, right? You got to get both for them to be a long-term employee. You got to get both for it to be great for both sides. And I think that's what a lot of people miss. Once we get that all in, then it's then it's pretty gravy from there. If they're a fit and we have the budget and we're ready to put them in place, then we get them going. Um, in our recent cycle, we actually held up. You know, when war started and all the other craziness began, we actually put uh, the brakes on our hire and we left our ads up, but we let everybody in the filter and everybody in the system know, hey, 
we're going to pause for a minute and look around and make sure that we can bring you in and not immediately have to let you go because that would be stupid, right, on both parts. So we let a lot of people know where we're at. And what was cool is a lot of people said, man, no one ever even answers us, much less lets us know where we stand, right? And I think that's another thing that most companies are missing, like actually being straight with the people that they're interviewing as to what's going on, right? What if somebody said to you, hey, Freddie, we don't really need another interview, but we're trying to stall and keep you in the system because we know we're not going to hire you for a month. Well, that would make a whole lot more sense than let me stall you out with a bunch of interviews. Like actually tell people what's going on. Hey, Freddie, you're perfect, but the guy you're hiring, we're thinking about firing him. And so we're not sure if the next guy is going to want you. So, hey, be patient for two months and we'll hit you back. And hey, if you got to take a job and you got to feed your family and got to do your thing, go ahead. And we'll come after you. And maybe five years from now, you end up working here. If, it, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. Like, what if companies actually told you things like that? That'd be crazy, right? Actually being straight with one another. Yeah, that's a good transparency. 100%. I don't, think, I don't think we're honest with each other in this world in a lot of areas, especially in hiring. I don't think we talk about money soon enough. I don't think we talk about whys and culture fit soon enough. And we absolutely are not clear with candidates where they stand and what's going on. And I think that absolutely sucks. I think Alice wanted to say something. Mm. Were you going to say something? Oh, well, I was just going to say I agreed with that. If gift companies actually told you something would be much better. I mean, I waited a couple months of nothing just sure. to get a letter that said, hey, eh, not going to work out. Well, and if you sit around and hope, um, A, you weren't listening to anything I said, and B, you're a dumbass. Right. Because you need to take control of your own career and your own getting hired. And so you need to be constantly getting offers. And I say this many times, you know, if you have you have one offer, you have no choice. If you have two, you have a dilemma. And if you have three or more, you can actually make a choice. Right. So you want as many offers as possible in as many areas. And you really got to put yourself out there a gajillion times. Right. Because, I mean, what's the average for you guys right now? How many hope apply for us do you have to apply for to actually get an interview? What's your number nowadays? For me, it's different than most. Of the, <laughs> um, internship, it was the first one. And then sure. full, full time was within like five. Okay. Because you, what, you have experience. Um, you're close to graduation. Are you a so, sought after commodity? Uh, <laughs> I'd like to think so. Or I'd like to be able to have the skills to live up to that, I guess you could say. But for the job that I'm currently in, I mean, it matched exactly to kind of what I wanted. I wanted okay. to get into sales. And at a career fair, I talked to them, ended up, they liked me, and they reached out and said, hey, we'd like to interview. So, Well, and this is a good thing for everybody to kind of take from this, Alex, is get in there early, right? If there's a company you want to work for, start as an intern, right? For many years, the only way into Disney was to be in their internship program. You could not hire in from the outside at all, right? I don't know if they've changed that recently, but that's the way it was for a long time. And I think everybody ought to take that to heart. If there's a big company you want to be a part of, get in there as an intern, and that way you get all your, your F-ups out of the way while it's funny and you're an intern. And then when you get hired, you've already made the connections. Everybody knows you. They know your work ethic. They know all those other kind of things. And you're an easy hire. And I think more companies should do that, right? Yeah. yeah. For- we're, we're in a slightly different spot. We do consulting engineering, and our final product is your engineering stamp. You've got to have five to six years of experience on a license to be able to do the things we do. So our internship program, we kind of put it on halt because we weren't getting as much out of it or putting as much into it as we needed to. We end up needing to hire people that have been out of school a couple of years and have some experience so that they're closer to get their stamps so we have a product to provide, right? Now, in the older days, we had some more turnkey drafting type projects. And so we would hire in interns to get that experience and do that kind of work and then eventually hope to hire them. But a lot of that work is, is gone elsewhere or we don't, you know, we've moved away to hire margin type work. So for us, our internship program, we didn't feel like we were able to invest in it the way we needed to. So it wasn't fair. So we've kind of held that up. But other companies, I think they should really look into it more. And I encourage you guys, any of you guys that intern or co-opt, when you get into your company, bring it up. Hey, why don't we have an internship or co-op program? I actually, three of the companies I worked for, I started their co-op program because I had been a co-op that worked at multiple companies. So I understood it, how it worked, how to deal with the schools, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of those guys that came in and worked as interns and co-ops for me are running those companies nowadays. All right, let's get to work here, Freddie. What questions you got? What do you talk about with the with the VPs of the company 
because I don't know what, what to expect. I asked the HR, like, do you have any tips for that? And he was like, just be yourself. Okay, so a couple of quick things for you. First off, internet stalked the shit out of him, right? Yeah, I I looked the guy. And, and here's kind of the important point. So to make a connection with someone, you'd really like to have three points of contact as a minimum. And sometimes you might have to manufacture them. Maybe you get lucky and you both went to the same school and he's from an area that's close to where you're from and he knows a guy that you know. And you mention all three of those. Hey, I saw you went to Mississippi State. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, I used to live not far from Nashville. Oh, you know Sam? Yeah, I know him. Oh, cool. All right. Well, Sam said you were a great guy, so let's get started. Now you've already established rapport and made a connection, right? That's super because people are going to hire people that they feel comfortable with. And that's fortunate and unfortunate. It's fortunate if you can make that connection. It's unfortunate if you don't match their color, race, creed, experience, major school they went to and all those kind of things, right? Because you can get screened out. And that's why you want to get around those things as much as possible. You want to get around these gatekeepers and have five or six people trying to hire you from this company. Now, if the final person is a VP, you need to see what they're VP of. Here's a good point. A lot of companies will make every freaking body a vice president. Like I worked at a company, there were 12 vice presidents. Every vice president had a manager under them and every manager had two people working under them. So a company of less than 50 people had 12 vice presidents. So basically it was useless, right? It was just a stupid title. And it's funny because at my company, I decided that we would never have a vice president ever, no matter what. So if anyone ever gets promoted to vice president at Phoenix, we know that I'm retired and I'm out of here. So that's a joke. I have this like promotion letter that I sometimes I tell my guys, you're about to be vice president because I'm about to be out of here, right? But anyway, just look and see what it is in the company. If there's one vice president, cool. Maybe it's a culture fit. Maybe it's almost like talking to the top guy or the owner or something like that. If it's the VP of engineering and it's an engineering job, that's sweet, right? If it's the VP of upholstery or floral design, you know, maybe they're just filling a spot, right? You also got to see where you're at in the sequence, right? If you talk to the HR guy, you've never talked to anybody in engineering or staff or manager, and you're already to the VP guy, well, you need to figure out how big this company is, right? If it's super small, you need to go in and show him that you can wear a lot of hats and you can handle stuff for him and do all the stuff that he needs. If it's a really big company, you need to kind of get a feel for why the hell didn't you talk to somebody in between, right? When do they actually assess your skills? And if they haven't at that point and you're going in to talk to the VP of engineering, you're probably going to get a skills assessment, right? Right. Yeah, that's what I'm expecting. This is a product development position, so... Uh, so yeah, I'm expecting and they, they work with automation and all that. So I'm expecting kind of like PLC questions, but I don't like, I'm not sure if it's going to be that or if it's going to be sure. other things. Are in. Well, you also want to look at their age, who they are, are they a boomer, Gen X, are they a millennial, you know, all those kind of things. So you get a feel for, you know, the older ones are going to ask you stupid questions. Like how much dirt is in a hole one foot by one foot by one foot. What do you think, Alex? How much dirt's in a hole one foot by one foot by one foot? Quick. Come on. <laughs> Come on, quick. How much foot is sorry, what did, you were breaking the cutting out of so he, did, he didn't hear me, right? So he's already I out. Did not. We already let this guy go. How much dirt's in a hole one foot by one foot by one foot? I feel like it's a trick question. Come on, quick. You don't need a calculator. A foot cubed? You think there's dirt in a hole? Oh see, I told you. <laughs> is there a fourth of July in England? Depends on what calendar you celebrate. Well, already you've told me that you're apprehensive and won't make a decision. So if that was a job where I needed a decision maker, you're already out, right? You got me? And those are what they're somewhat designed to do. But sometimes, unfortunately, the interviewer got to ask that crap back in his day. And so he's just trying it because he doesn't know anything else to do. And it's completely useless for the job. You should probably study up on stupid interview questions like that so you'd already be ready for that. That way you can get through to the actual stuff. I will say this. If they do ask you something that just seems asinine, like, hey, um, you, you know, describe an elephant in the room. Like, what the hell are you even talking about, right? Then just, just come straight back at them. Hey, can you explain to me how this fits in with how I do the job? Because I'd really like to show you how I can do the job, right? I have no idea. This seems like a trick question. You know, it seems like I'm back in school or something. Like, can you be straight with me what we're trying to do here? All right, so here's a really good question, and it actually saved me once, got me thrown out of an interview, and got me a job offer. So it's done one of all three. I would ask, what makes you get up and come in here every day? Okay, like the why question. I was top of class, great experience. I was the sought-after diamond, right? 
when I was coming. I had 12, 15 job offers when I finished school and another 10 when I finished grad school. I had already researched the company. I knew everything there was to know. What I was looking for was culture fit because I wasn't in the interview if I didn't want the job and didn't want to work for the company. I did just go to interviews unless I needed some practice or hadn't had one in a while, right? So if I was sitting there with them, they were exactly who I wanted to work for. Now I needed to make sure they were the right people, right? That the culture was right, that I was going to be able to get along with people, that they were going to, you know, invest in me and help me train and give me the opportunity to work really hard because that's who I was, right? So I would ask those kinds of questions, like what makes you get up and come in here every day? And it was interesting because I had one um, and the lady was in HR and it was for a manufacturing company. And I really liked the company and I really liked the location. And her answer to me, Freddie, was don't like don't come in here. This job sucks. I'm quitting in three weeks. I hate this place. It's the worst culture I've ever been in. And I was like, oh, appreciate your time. That saves me greatly. I, I had another where it made the person so angry. They actually walked me to the door. Now, that told me immediately that wasn't the place for me, right? If I can't ask a question and get answered, but I'm going to be shown to the door. And I got to look, and no one had ever worked there more than like one or two years. The place was just a revolving door of turnover, right? And you could tell why just from the answer to that question. And the other one, the guy sat back for a while, and we talked like we had been friends for 20 years for like the next hour of all the reasons he actually did get up and come in there and how important this company was and what they were doing in the world and all that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, that's one of the places I wanted to work. So that's a good one. And you can modify your own version, right? Don't just use my words, use Freddie's words or Alex's words or Zoe's words or whoever. Find something that fits for you to be able to identify what the culture is there. Now, be careful how you ask it, right? So if you come in and it's fast paced, they need a lot of help, you know, they don't have anybody. And your first question is, hey, will you pay for me to go to grad school? You're probably being shown the door, right? You can ask that in a different way, though. Hey, has anyone here gotten advanced degrees while working here? And are we able to work that in where we can make sure you get all your work done, yet still get smarter so that we can do more? Work on the wording of that. Practice that in front of the mirror. Mock interview each other so you can practice saying that over and over again. But whatever these things in it are that are kind of like non-negotiables for you, if you do want to get a master's and you do want to do it while you're at the company, you need to kind of bring that up, but you have to do it in a way that makes sense for them. You don't ask questions that only you care about, if that makes any sense, Freddie. Like the worst question anyone can ask and is asked all the time, how many weeks of vacation do I get? I don't even know if you can do the job yet and you're already asking about vacation. Maybe you're not as dedicated as I thought for the person that I might want. Yeah. Think about that. If you were hiring somebody and the first questions they ask are what are the benefits and how much vacation do I get and how soon can I take it? And you're a young startup that needs people that are excited about what you're doing. That's probably not a good fit. Yeah, because I was thinking I wanted to ask things about the job of what I'm going to do, but I don't know to what extent they will think that, oh, you didn't read the description of the job or whatever. Well, okay. So you can always phrase it as, hey, let me clarify something. My impression at this point is you're going to have me doing X. Is that accurate? If you've already had a technical interview and you're asking the VP of engineering what you're going to do every day, that doesn't make any sense either, right? So again, it's back to where is this in the process and what have each of you told each other? What does he know of what you've already done? That's another one. Like I've been in companies where they had the same, you know, three different people ask you the same stupid question because they didn't realize the other one had already done it. So that immediately tells you it's a corporate crazy place that doesn't communicate, which could be good, right? Then you can fly below the radar and get your experience. And for you, you could get your your visa done because it's a big company and you could fly under the radar and hide from people and make some money and start a side business while you're working there and all that kind of stuff. But on the flip side, if you want to work somewhere where you can progress and make a difference and not you know, lose your mind with corporate meetings and politics and crap like that, then it, they immediately tell you that's probably not the place for you. All right, let's post some questions in chat. There's, what, more people on here. Zoe better be zinging me with questions. How are you doing, Zane? What's up, Zoe? Zoe's probably going to be the VP that's interviewing you soon, Freddie. I had a question that some, like, there are, like, two people that I couldn't come that wanted to ask you, but they're right here. They were asking about if you'd rather start in a big or a small company. All right, so if you're in engineering, technical, mechatronics, on the technical side, which a lot of us here are, my advice is this. Look for that company that I'm going to call them medium stage, right? So they're past the startup. They're past the first five or six people. 
they've proved a product, they maybe they just got a big influx of investment capital, right? And you can do Google search for them and look for if they had equity moves or if they had a series A or if they had a big investment group pump some money into them. You'd love to see that because they got a proven product and they're about to spend a bunch of money and they don't have enough people to do it, which means you get to be on the literally wild, wild west, right? You get to be on the forefront. You get the opportunity to do everything because there's nobody to do it. You get a chance to fill the box, right? You get a chance to do all kinds of stuff that you don't know how to do. You might get 10 years of experience in two years because you're working 24 hours a day. And you're constantly learning and studying and connecting and going on site and doing all this kind of things. So fresh out of school, I would look for something like that, right? Cutting edge technology, got some funding. It's bigger than a mom and pop shop. It's not so big you're going to get lost in corporate shuffle, right? You'd like to be able to come in and make a name for yourself is Freddie's the one that saved us on project, whatchamacallit, and made us $50 million, right? Because you're set for life. There you go right? And you'd like to have that opportunity. It also, it, it's a good balance because you have enough money, they're not going to fold and you're out of a job and looking again, right? But they have enough stuff to do that it's not so many people that everybody's job has been whittled down to literally nothing, right? Like when I worked at Lockheed, I got to work on aircraft, but I didn't get to work on aircraft. I got to work on like this little piece of the aircraft. My buddy spent like a year working on one little bolt on one little bracket on the F-22. He still doesn't even know where it goes in the F-22. But that's all he got to do because it was such a big company, they had melted it all down to this precise one thing this guy needed to do. That's not where you want to be, right? Especially fresh out of school. You wanted to be earlier in the process where they were just coming up with the aircraft, right? They'd already gotten the concept, they built a few prototypes, now they're putting it in production and they're trying to fix all the mistakes and there's not enough people. That's where you want to be, right? then you can make a name for yourself, you can get experience, and everything that you jack up is expected, right? Because you're doing things that no one's ever done before. So that's what I would look for. The other and the most important of all of them is who is your direct report? And how much investment are they going to put into you? Does your personality and their personality clash? Or does it collect and help each other? Does it build upon each other? Like, are you better together than you are apart? Like if you, if you don't want anyone to ever bother you and they're a micromanager, that's probably not going to go well. Vice versa, if they come by once every two years, like the first guy I worked for at Lockheed, that's probably not what you're looking for, right? Because you'd like to have a mentor and somebody to talk you through stuff and somebody to teach you technical things and all that kind of stuff. What would you say are the most important skills to develop while young in order to prepare for owning a business? Turn $1 into two. That's it. Just start there. Turn $1 into two. Well, how do I do that? Exactly. Well, I don't know how to do that. Of course you don't. But what does that mean? Figure it out, right? Like if you need any more detail on how to turn $1 into two, owning the business probably isn't for you. Because businesses don't come with manuals. We have no idea what the hell we're doing. We're making it up on the fly every single day. We're constantly having things thrown in our way and in front of us and taxes and laws and insurance and all that crap trying to beat us down. So that's number one. Turn $1 into two. Your, your other is uh, learn to sell. If you can't get on the phone and talk to somebody and explain to them what's going on and get passion involved and get them excited and get them wanting to break down a wall to do business with you, then you're not going to do very well owning a business. Oh, but what if I'm super technical and my co-founder is the most amazing salesperson ever? We'll have him learn some tech and you learn some sales. Now you got an even better machine. If you can't, as an engineer, sit and explain to someone who's not an engineer very clearly what you do and they understand it, then it's time to get to work. Well, how do I do that? Well, you start talking to people. You, you sign up for Toastmasters. You get on calls like this and talk the whole time, right? You go do the things that are uncomfortable for you and you're not good at. And that's the biggest part of owning a business is handling what comes at you next, which you never know what it's going to be. It might be a clogged toilet in the bathroom with the main customer here. Or it might be all of your IT just crashed out. Or it might be a technical problem. Or it might be how the hell are we going to pay for payroll this week because our customer didn't send their check in. Right? It's constant problems and solutions and all those kind of things. So turn $1 into two. That's, that's numero uno. If you can do that, you're off and going. Number two is learn how to sell. Let me go into that for a minute, though, because a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to be a spammy salesman. Well, who? I didn't say be a spammy salesman. A true salesperson is not trying to sell someone anything. They're trying to solve a problem. If I knock on your door and I'm trying to shove siding down your mom's throat for her house 
and I'm not taking no for an answer and I'm just aggravating the shit out of her, then I'm a spammy salesman. I need to be slammed the door in my face. If I knock on a door and I say, hey, I noticed some sidings falling off your house. It's kind of old. Would you like me to put that up for you for free? And in exchange, could I give you a quote for putting new stuff on? Because I really don't want water coming in your house and messing up what you got going on. So I'd be happy to take care of that for you. Well, that guy's probably going to get a shot, right? He's solving a problem. He's helping the customer, not helping himself. So in sales, here's the cool part about this. And this is why I bring this up. As engineers, we are helpful by nature, right? It's our best and worst trait. We help everyone, but we'll never tell anyone no. And that's why we're so good and so frustrated all the time. So as an engineer, if I look at sales as I'm here to help someone, well, now it's not spammy and negative, right? Now it's positive. Now I can help more people. That, that helps a lot. So would you say, just to kind of add on that, the job that I'm in right now, it's sales. It's a uh, commercial HVAC sales. What would be the best way to approach that going in fresh, never doing sales before and now jumping into a sales role? Okay, so a couple things. If you are fresh out of school and you took the sales gig, you probably just set yourself up for failure because three years from now, you're not going to know how to do anything technical if you're not careful, okay? You need to keep your technical skill set. You need to go back in the lab. You need to go to the on-site. You need to go to the installations. You need to go hang out with the design engineers. You need to go hang out with the technical people. And you really need to understand the product technically inside and out, backwards and forwards, and be able to design it and build it and install it yourself. That is... That's 60% of your time, okay? The other 60% of your time is learning how to sell and make connections and help people and Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar and all the trainings that you can possibly do. But to answer your question, because you guys are all looking for the magic bullet and what's the best way to do something when there's a thousand different ways to do something, right? One thing that will help you is find the gray beard. Find the old guy that's the main sales guy and then just go help him make sales. Let him keep the, the whole commission if you can just ride along with him, right? If you can just hang out with him and help him, right? If you can learn his system, his process, how he does it, you know, who he connects with, how he talks to them, what jobs he goes after, what he doesn't. That's really the best possible way you can learn how to do it. Now, here's what can happen with you sometimes. You hire into a company and you're their first sales engineer and you're fresh out of school because they're broke and they can't afford anybody. So they hired your dumb ass to come in and try to fix it. And the owner doesn't like talking to people. So he thought he'd just hire a salesperson and he, he wants somebody technical so they can talk about his product. Well, who do you need to talk to? You probably need to go talk to the owner or whoever it is that started this company and the passion behind it and all those kind of things and drag that shit out of them. That way you can be the conduit to communicate what that company and that product are all about to others. And in the process, remember, you're spending 60% of your time learning how to do sales and connect with people. Um, there's a bunch of great Tony Robbins courses. Spend the money. Spend the four or five grand. Spend the 10 grand. Take them. Be amazing, right? You don't need a whole lot of sales to make up for that amount of money. The other thing is, at some point, you're going to have to make the call, Alex. Do I want to be a sales guy or a tech guy? Because there is a point where the tech train probably leaves you behind. And I think you guys have all noticed um, it happens at the beginning of your junior year, because now you're technology illiterate compared to the freshmen coming in. It happens again senior year because the juniors know more how to do things than you did. What do you mean? Ross bots. What are they? Right. You know what I mean? New stuff is constantly coming up. Uh, you know, we reinvent the industry every few years. So at some point, you've got to make the decision. Do I want to be a sales guy and a manager or do I want to work in engineering and technical? Right. And you might in your career. And this is what I did. I kind of bounced back and forth. I'd work for a while in management sales, building a company, and then I'd go back and be a technical engineer for a while. And then I eventually started my own company where I can bounce back and forth every day. Half my day I do sales, half my day I'm a, a PE, a proven products and doing technical stuff. What do you think are the most important things to develop to transition from a mid-career engineer to a senior engineer? Do senior engineers actually work on harder problems or what is the difference in what they do? I feel like early to mid is a clear experience gate, but mid to senior is more nebulous. All right, so... It's going to kind of depend on you and the company. It depends on how many people they have and how many layers of technology they have. So we have the fresh kids coming in, maybe that are doing the CAD and making shit work and going on site. You have the mid-levels that are actually doing most of the work. And then you have the super smart people that are handling the big technical problems or maybe the big proposals or working with customers to build solutions. Every company, that's going to be slightly different when you get that senior title, right? 
for us, it's when you've got your stamp, you've got enough experience to teach other people, and we really don't look at how many years you're out of school or any of that kind of, or how many years you've been here or any of that kind of stuff. So becoming a senior engineer with us, the accountability chart changes tremendously of what your responsibilities are, and when you're ready to take them, off you go. For you, I would put it off as long as possible uh, because you still want plausible deniability for a while. You still want to be able to do all the work and do the cool stuff and learn how to do things and work on the really advanced projects while still hiding behind you don't really know what you're doing yet. If Zoe got made senior engineer at her company, I'd be really worried about the company because she hasn't been out of school very long and she's working in a really high-end technology. So if she's the best they have at the whole company, I probably would remove my investment from that company. Now, if she's the best there ever was at this new technology that's popped up and it might only be a couple years old, cool. Well, if she can talk the talk, walk the walk, and do the thing, then be the senior engineer. Just be ready to prove yourself, so to speak, when you rock in the room. For your, Let me go back and make sure I answered the question, though. What are some things you can do to help with that transition? For your transition from mid to senior, uh, the big things are learning how to work with people and make connections. You want to study, study personality types and disc profiles and Myers-Briggs and some of those kind of things to get a feel for how people work together. That will help you make that transition so that you can be more effective, so you can get the right people on your team, so you can deal with management, so you can deal with that crazy project manager and all those kind of things. And the other part is you really want to get into the business model of the business you're working in. You want to understand what's your key product, what are your gross margins, what are the product costs, what actually matters. So as a senior engineer, if I spend 99% of my time saving us a billionth of a percent on cost, I probably didn't do my job. I should go look at what the overall product is and go, man, it's, you know, 45% of the cost is this startup initial programming. How can I make that better? And then there's more money for you and for everybody else. So business side, dealing with people are probably the things you need to look for to make that transition. So you think it requires a big mindset shift. I think all of life requires a big mindset shift. So I have a question. Um, and also, Angel, if you have any questions, you're free to ask or whatever. We can help you out. So we have a national convention next week. What are some tips that you can give like during those huge events? Because you have a two-day career fair. There's like 10,000 kids talking with the different companies you get so many connections, but what are, what are some tips that you, you will give? All right. So a couple tips, I would uh, look at the schedule beforehand and make sure you're in the area of the cool shit. Let, let's say you worked aerospace and there was a, you know, six generation stealth technology exhibit. That's probably the people you want to talk to. So you want to be around just before and just after that class, right? You want to be in that area. So that's what you want to look for is kind of strategically map out the area. If you're in the, the World Congress Center here in Atlanta, there's only a couple of levels. There's a couple of main presentation rooms, and you just filter your way back and forth between those because that's where everybody's going to be traveling, and that's where you'll connect with people, right? That's where you'll stumble into the dude that you've researched and you know who he is, and you trip and fall in front of him or whatever the hell it takes to get their attention. So being in the right spot to make the connection is key, and being in the right spot to learn the thing you wanted to learn is key. If you know the best dude in the world at that is given a talk, well, then wedge your way in there standing room only in that room no matter what it takes right and then ask him a stupid question so dumb that he remembers you when you come up to talk to him later and i don't mean stupid like like simple question i mean something that that is memorable right you know what i mean okay make a fool of yourself if you need to that's an easy way for everybody to remember you. hey i was the idiot that asked the stupid question about such and such right all right another key tip for you guys be ready to connect in all the different ways that are possible, right? So if I talk to a boomer Gen X guy, business cards, right? If I talk to the millennial dude, I might do the phone bump, right? I might do the IG if I'm a Gen Z, right? You need to be ready to connect in all those different matters, okay? The other thing you want to do is have the notes and speech to text on your phone very quickly because you want to put in your notes, date, and then kind of timestamp when you have time, but pop in, talk to Sally, mechanical engineer with aerospace company, need to send her a picture of an airplane. Like give yourself notes, right? Give yourself little pauses between conversations. The other one is try to submit people's names. 
okay? Everyone plays this bullshit game of, oh, I'm no good with names. No, you choose to be no good with names, okay? There's like nine scientific techniques to learn people's names when you meet them. Study them and look them up and practice them, okay? I'm not even going to go into what they are because you guys can take the time to do that. So learn people's names and use them. There's nothing better than hearing your own name. And there's nothing worse than hearing your own name pronounced incorrectly after you've already told them how to pronounce it. And there's nothing worse than them mispronouncing it and then making fun of you and saying, oh, I never, I have trouble with complicated names. Well, that means you just don't care about people, right? You got me? Yeah. Okay. Let's go back. Be in the right area to make the connections with the people you want to talk to, doing the things you want to talk about, right? Be ready to connect in five or six different ways. Even if it's... Ta- Dude, if it's the most important person on earth and your phone just died and you can't find your card, well, Sharpie on your arm whatever it takes to get enough information that you can connect with that person. And then the second you get away from them, speech to text, what went down and what you need to talk to them about. If they mention something that's coming up, send them a news clip about it. Send them an email. Hey, I appreciate your time. And I think it was super cool what you were saying about such and such, like make it a personal connection when you actually send that connection. Right. And take a minute you're better off having five to six really solid, deep connections than 150 shallow ones. Quantity is not necessarily your friend here. Quality is. Don't only talk to one person, though. Another thing is, if let's say you go there with three really good friends. And I'll give you an example. So I went to a business conference last February with my wife. And I told her when we landed in Mexico, I said, I won't see you all week because I already know you. This ain't a vacation, and we're not here together. We're here as a team, and we're here to talk to as many people as possible. So you're going to work one half of the room, and I'm going to work the other half. And if we're ever in the same place at the same time, we failed. Unless we're making a connection. Hey, Zane, you need to talk to this guy. Hey, Rachel, you need to talk to this guy, right? So you guys need to, like, set up teams, right? Especially if there's multiple things you guys want to do going on at the same time. Okay, well, Freddie's going to go over here. Zoe's going to go over here, Angel's going to go over here, Alex is going to go over here, and then you guys come together in the middle of the day and trade names of people to talk to. And that way, when you see that guy, hey, Freddie told me all about you. Holy shit, who's Freddie? Oh, he was talking to you yesterday, and he was telling you about such and such. Oh, wow, someone actually remembered and knows who I am, right? Now you're making a really deep connection. Okay, so there's kind of your tips. Tag team it, work as a team, speech to text, be able to connect in five or six different ways. Awesome. I have like 10,000 questions yet. So I'm doing this thing that there's a company that I'm interested in. I'm looking up the people that are working in the position that it's open on LinkedIn. And, and I'm in the process of adding them. But how would you approach to them? Because we have talked about and you have mentioned it. Find the person like that's doing what you want to do. Ask him, like, what the hell, how the hell you got in there? That question, but I don't know how to phrase it in a way that's respectful and you don't seem like a guy is like, okay, this guy's just asking me for the job. Okay, a couple things here. You do need to be careful. So if you're in the middle of the interviewing process. No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Well, let's go both routes. Let's just say you were in the middle of interviewing or you booked an interview or they posted a job or something like that. That's probably not the time to go start asking people because all they're going to hear is you're coming to take their job. They may not even know a job's posted and now they're worried about their job. So they're sure as hell not going to help you. You you got me? Plus, you might get the HR person fired because they weren't supposed to let anybody know that they were getting rid of Joe and hiring Freddie, right? You do have to be careful with that, especially in small to medium-sized companies because nobody talks to anybody. Now, on the flip side of that, so let's say you have identified a company and you found some people that work there under the job title you eventually want to work at and you've never had any contact with them and you don't see any jobs posted, or maybe you do. The old, hey, I'm Freddie, I'm fresh out of school, I'm in mechanical engineering, I noticed you work at such and such, which looks like really cool work. Could I buy you a, a DoorDash lunch in exchange for answering one question? I need like six minutes. Very few engineers are going to turn that down. And just up what you're offering for how important this person is. Like for me, sometimes I get a similar offer to that, I guess, because I've said it enough that people try it with me every once in a while. And what I'll do is I'll get someone to answer him back and just say, hey, uh, he'll answer, you know, one question via email, send it on. 
you know, but at least you've made the connection. That's what I'm getting at. You may have to up the offer. If it's absolutely the person on it, just let them know. I'll, I'll mow your grass, wash your car, walk your dog, do whatever the hell it takes to get two minutes with you. I'll stand outside the building while you're going to your car this afternoon. Give me 30 seconds. If it's that important and you make that big of an impression, then then that's how you get in. What if they leave you on read? Is that what you're saying, Zoe? Well, there's more than one way to get to people, okay? And this is my one of my biggest problems with the under 30 crowd. God damn it, there's more than one way to connect with people, and text is not the only way. Mail them a stupid letter. You know how somebody got in with me the other day? They sent me a hand-addressed, handwritten, stamped letter. I haven't seen one of those in 22 years, right? Find a way. Send a basket. Show up. What'd you do, Freddie? First time you met me... You stood outside my door for two hours. And then when someone finally let you in, you had to sit there for like another hour till I got out of meetings. And then you only got, what I give you? Like one question? Dude, you got a minute. What you got? Right? Sometimes you just got to make yourself available. So how do you get in? The biggest answer to that, Freddie, is you don't take no for an answer. And even admit to that. Here's something we do with our customers. I was on the phone with one the other day. We were talking through a meeting. And okay, it looks like you have an opportunity. And Mike, our sales guy is trained to either get a job or a restraining order. So he's going to keep calling you for the rest of your life until we get an opportunity. And everybody laughs about it. But we are serious. He's going to keep calling the guy. But at least I've called it out and made it clear. You can let them know that. Hey, I'm going to message you every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern for the rest of my life and the rest of your life until you give me one minute of your time in exchange for a DoorDash once. And then you know what? Every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Eastern, no matter where you are in the entire earth, if you're in the hospital, that email or that call goes in. Took me 17 calls to get into one customer. Every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., he got a message from me. Hey, I'm calling back again like I said I would. And you know what? Next week I'm going to call again until you give me a chance. Don't take no for an answer is the answer to your question. Do you recommend working in office, factory, sites, or... I know it depends on what you want to do but i guess is so if you're in mechanical electrical mechatronics you know those kind of things right uh if you don't have a family and you don't have kids i highly recommend taking the extremely terrible manufacturing plant job in the middle of damn nowhere okay work third shift in the paper mill go to the carpet manufacturer in north georgia do whatever the hell it takes to get experience Take a job where you're going to get to do stuff, not sit in an office and make copies. Oh, I got a great job at Lockheed with great benefits. So what do you do all day? Well, I'll surf the internet. Sweet. Where are you going to be in 10 years, right? Probably not where you want to be. Oh, I took this job for half pay. I'm working third shift in the middle of damn nowhere, Alabama, but I just rebuilt an entire paper machine with two tech guys. Who do you think got more experience, right? You guys need to look more for where is it going to get you than what's it paying and what do you get right now, okay? You need to invest in your future. You're doing this for you, not them. Whatever job you're taking should be helping you get where you want to go, not helping them do something. Now, you do need to help them do something because you need to provide value in return for what you do get. You want to exceed whatever they're paying you. If they're paying you 70 k a year, then you do 100 k of work, but you also get 100 k of experience, right? Stay late, hang out on the weekends. I used to end my co-op job every day, and then I would go work in the panel shop on night shift, and they let me build and wire control panels. So I could build an entire assembly line control panel by myself, all the wiring, all the controls, all the electrical, and all that stuff. I'm a mechanical engineer. How'd I learn how to do that? I went out, nobody paid me shit, but I got a lot of experience. So To answer your question, take whichever job gives you the most experience in the shortest amount of time to get you to where you want to get. Do stuff. Don't listen to your poor dad who's a sheep and does what he's told and sits in traffic all day and has worked the same stupid job for 25 years and is going nowhere, right? He's going to tell you, oh, get those benefits and get that vacation and get that big salary. That shit means nothing, right? Because if I can learn a technical skill that helps me start a company that goes to $4 billion and gets sold and I make 200 million bucks, that's probably worth more than, oh, I got 70K coming out of the gate instead of 65. Look at me. I took a job at Lockheed where I made a lot of money, had amazing benefits, and didn't do shit for a year and a half. 
And then I quit that job, took a company that literally paid me half of what I was making before. I worked literally 24 hours a day and built a massive department for them. But I got about 20 years of experience in four years. And it's helped me build the company that I have now, which I'm doing a lot better than I was when I worked at Lockheed. So the answer to your question is whatever gets you the most experience in the shortest amount of time. What strategies and approaches have you employed to balance the technical intricacies and innovation in your engineering work with the demands of running a successful business? For me, I'm at the point now where I have enough people to learn all the new stuff. So I'm the PE that's kind of reviewing things at the end. I work a lot more on the business and sales side because that's where I'm needed and that's where a lot of my talent is. Now I can come in and do some heavy lifting technology if I need to, but in reality, I'm on the tail end of my career and I don't need to get any smarter. How do you balance that? Do whatever is best for whatever it is you're trying to do. You also, remember, you can split your day into thirds. You have a third to sleep and do you. You have a third to do your job or your work. And you have a third to create your business and your future and your finances. Oh, well, I don't want to work more than eight hours a day. And then you're probably not going to get anywhere. Because your success in life is dictated by what you do from 6 p.m. to about 9 p.m. every night. If you're on TikTok and watching the latest Netflix series you're probably going to be one of the sheep and doing what you're told the rest of your life, right? If you're studying and training and going to Toastmasters and staying late building control panels, then you're probably going to go somewhere. If you're trying to turn $1 into two and sell things and make things happen in your after hour, super cool. Another one good strategy for you, Alex, is sign up for all of the, the groups and, and look for the really weird ones. I have a newsletter I'm in that's military technology and it's a great newsletter. I think it comes out like once a month or something. And it's always some crazy shit I've never heard of, right? I'm not in that area anymore. I don't work in aerospace. I don't work in the military, but it's great information. So make those connections. You'll get a lot of emails and spam and newsletters, and you can just kind of filter through them or digest them or dump them into chat GPT and have them summarized. But that's a great way to keep up to speed. Uh, go to some of their conferences every now and again. Go to some conference that you have no idea what the industry even is. If it's in Vegas, super cool, because then you can have some fun while you're there if the conference sucks, right? But that's a good way to keep up to date with what's going on. Um, another one is where I get all my news, which is Reddit. So you can set up a couple of the subreddits and filter through new technology that's posting every few minutes. So I would get out there and dig into that kind of stuff. And again, everything's changing so fast that um, everyone's worried about falling behind. Just get back on the train. There's some new stuff coming, and you just jump back ahead. Uh, he also asked, how do you make sure your business remains competitive and innovative? It kind of depends on your business. So I, I think this is something some people miss. Dude that sells car batteries probably makes more money than dude that invents the next greatest bread slicer. You don't have to be on the cutting edge to make money. You can do old, boring businesses. You can own a laundromat. There's no new technology there, dude. But it still makes money, and it helps you do what you want to do. So I think the answer to your question is it kind of depends on what your business is. If, you, if you're building the Nets autonomous cargo plane, you probably need to spend a lot of money on the R&D and development and senior projects and getting master students working on things and getting into the lab and all that kind of stuff. If you have an old school wood construction company, hey, you get a new nail gun every once in a while. That's about it. You do whatever you need uh, for your business to succeed. If you've ever dealt with an account manager, what's one thing you disliked about the interaction, one thing you remembered? In other words, if there's one thing you wish account managers did better when selling, what would that be? I'm assuming account manager means like the sales rep or whatever. The biggest problem I have and have seen over the years with sales reps, account managers, whatever you want to call them, um, is it's pretty clear the ones that are out for themselves. They'll come around when their boat payments do. They'll come around when their kids' colleges do. They'll stoke you up once or twice a year and you get used to their pattern because they need money. They suck. Screw them, right? Dude that's constantly checking in on you is constantly bringing things you don't necessarily know that you need is trying to help you do things more. One of the things we do for our customers, we're an engineering consulting company, and we try to help fund them a fabricator. Well, who the hell else is going to do that? The big question we often ask is what, does our pro or what problem does our solution create? So we just design them something. Well, who's going to build it? Maybe we can help them make that connection. Well, now they're going to stay with us a lot longer because our account manager is helping them get better in everything else, not just what we do. So make sure you're there for, I'll call it the right reason, build the long-term relationship. Be nice to people, know them, take care of them. Um, you never know where they're going to end up and where you're going to end up. I'll give you an example of that. So I 
my company's probably banked at 10 different banks because this one dude that we really liked named Doug just kept moving to a different bank. So every time he moved, we would move because we liked him. He was our account rep, so to speak. We built a personal relationship with him. I could call him right now and figure out how to solve problems and have many times. So that's what you want to do is build those personal relationships. Uh, no Reddit handles, Zoe. I'm still anonymous. And if I did have it, I wouldn't tell you. As an engineer turned business owner, you likely face complex technical problems in your career. Can you share a situation where you encountered a significant technical challenge within your business ops? How did you approach it from a business perspective? And what were the outcome in terms of both technical and financial aspects of your company? I'm not sure if we're the best spot to answer that question, Alex. I don't know. We do a lot of crazy hard things, and sometimes we completely jock them up. And what we try to do is to make sure that if we've reinvented technology or invented time travel, that we're going to be rewarded for it. So we want to make sure it's a big enough opportunity and a big enough customer. Uh, we've got one customer that we've had for probably a decade. Our first project, I think we lost like 2,200% on the first project. We were mega negative, but we built a system that we've been using for nearly a decade. So it kind of, we made an investment in the long term, and then we had to continue to build the relationship where some of the people know us has been there longer than a lot of people that work there. Do you employ project managers? Do you think engineers should be in charge of their own project management? I don't have two minds on this issue. And that's an amazing question, and that is very company-specific, Zoe. Um, it also kind of depends on the people you have. Um, it also depends on how your projects are set up. So I worked in a company that did a lot of government and contracts and a government big corporate-type projects. If they hadn't had PMs they were used to dealing with stupid contract bullshit, they would have folded and lost millions of dollars. On the flip side, in the company that had 12 vice presidents, and they probably had too many managers in the system and probably were not as responsive as they could have been. I've also looked at both directions in our company. I, I originally built this company to be somewhere I would want to work, and then I realized there's only one me, so that was stupid. And then I built the company completely differently, where the engineers just did engineering and really didn't talk to the customers, and that folded and probably should have crashed and gone out of business because that was stupid. And now we're kind of pseudo somewhere in the middle. Uh, we, we have a sales and an engineering person for each main customer that they know, uh, and that way they both get exposure to both areas. So I don't know. It kind of depends. I, I think everyone in engineering should take some kind of PM course and it doesn't have to be for college credit because there's so many that you can take online and get some stupid certificate or whatever it is. Was it PMP or something, whatever the latest and greatest little letters you can throw after your name are. I highly encourage you to at least study project management and more importantly, study small group theory and how to work in small groups and when that small group begins to break down. It's like, I think it's seven when communications start to break down. So when you get to 49 people in your company, that next person is really going to throw off the communications because you can really only have seven reporting to one. So now you've got two layers and you go into a third and now you really don't get your message from the owner out to that fourth layer of people. And so study project management and a study small group theory. MBA. All right, let's talk about two things there. So Alex has asked MBA, MBM, masters in general, when is it necessary? When is it not? Okay. If you're thinking of getting your MBA, A, I would ask why. B, there's a book called The 10-Day MBA. Read that. And if you still want to do that crap, then go get your MBA. Okay? The book is written by a dude who spent a couple hundred grand to get his MBA and realized, well, that was stupid. I could just put it in a book. And, like, it's in – it took me, I think, like, 27 days or something. It's a pretty hard book. There's a lot of material in an MBA. There's a lot to it. But I got enough of what I wanted. I wanted the highlights to know if I needed to hire one. I didn't give a shit about being one. Um, it depends on the route you want to go. A lot of people are like, well, I'm not a very good engineer, and I think I'll just get an MBA. That way I get paid a lot to not do anything. Well, that's probably not the route that you're going to get, right? You see a lot of these dudes who have engineering degrees and MBAs that are working at a corporate company and haven't done any damn thing worthwhile for 10 years. They're just kind of lost on the accounting sheet somewhere. I feel bad for those people. They could have done better, right? Now, masters in general, I highly, highly, highly recommend that if you get done with your bachelor's and you think you're now dumber than you've ever been and you liked your professors and you see a spot and an opportunity, get your master's right then while you're in school and do it in a technical area, right? You can never take that technical skill away. And here's how I describe this. Your bachelor's, you learn that there's all these different tools, right? And your master's, you learn how to apply some of them very specifically, 
So my bachelor's, I learned all the stuff I didn't know how to do. And there were areas of mechanical that I really liked. I liked stress analysis and I liked fatigue and fracture and I liked bolted and welded joints and connections. So one of my professors came to me and said, hey, I want you to stay and be my student, go to grad school. We'll pay X dollars a month, which was a fortune in Startville, Mississippi, and we'll pay for all your school and you get to hang out with your hot girlfriend and go to football and baseball games for another year and a half. And I was like, sold, I'm in, right? The other cool part is I eventually wanted to teach, and I knew if I had my master's that you don't have to have a PhD to teach at university. A master's is more than enough. So for me, those all kind of lined up. And it was the perfect opportunity because I had worked with a guy as a co-op, and I met him my sophomore year of school. He had been working on his master's for five years while working, taking it at night, you know, weekends, breaks, that kind of thing. He and I graduated with our graduate degree on the same day. It took him like a frickin' decade to get his master's degree while working. I did it in about a year and a half, right? So again, just get it out of the way. If you can get it paid for and get more experience, work for the department because you can fill out your resume and say all the cool things you did. Like me, I worked for a professor who basically did consulting like I do now. And we solved all kinds of cool problems out at manufacturing plants and designs that couldn't be fixed and things like that. So I got a year of job experience while getting a master's degree, while learning how to use these tools really, really, really well. So again, your engineers... Build a process that makes things happen, that assures results, that eliminates risk, right? Learn to speak, learn to talk, learn to answer that question. Practice negotiating. If you need to hire someone that hires people to practice hiring you and negotiating job salary with you and do it hundreds and hundreds of times, what would that be worth to you? If you could pay somebody a thousand bucks to spend a day with you practicing just negotiating your job offer and it got you an extra week vacation and 20K on your first job, which builds for the rest of your life, wouldn't that be a good investment? Yeah, it'd be amazing, right? And you'd be an idiot not to do that. I interviewed with this company at the beginning of the month, and they told me, like, hey, we'll, like, it went really well. I had everything happy. I was a director of engineering, and it was all cool. Uh, but he told me that if you don't hear from us in two weeks or after two weeks, don't freak out. We'll be reaching out. It's been more than two weeks. Uh, and, and I'm like, dude. Hey. So the thing is that next That's week. That's an easy I'm, email or call then. Yeah. Hey, dude, it's Freddie. It's been more than two weeks. I'm still not freaking out, but just touching base. It's easy peasy, right? Because, yeah, because uh, next week is a national convention, and they're going to be there. So I don't know if that's, like, way to ask them. It's like, hey, I interview with this guy. Get out beforehand and say, hey, can we connect at the convention? What days are you going to be there? Okay. And then as soon as you connect with him, he'll be obligated to tell you what's going on. The answer to most of these questions is talk to people and get the hell out of your little bubble chamber that you're sitting in all day every day. Well, how do I just go try it? Jack it up and you'll at least learn how not to do it. Okay. Alex, thoughts on negotiating a salary for the first job out of college? Yes. Be really good at it and do it. Is that a good enough answer? There are 10,000 books, trainings, YouTube videos on things you can ask for in a negotiation, especially on a salary right out of school. If you haven't chat GPT that and pulled all that stuff together, then what the hell are you doing? Because that can make you more money right now than anything. There are more than enough tools to answer every single one of these questions out there for you to build a system of how to get hired and negotiate your job. And think about it. You could probably pull the stats on what the average number of jobs in an engineer's career are. I bet it's four or five. So you're going to do this four or five times. You're probably going to talk to four to five companies each time. So you've got 20 to 25 of these to go. So why wouldn't you get really good at it? Why wouldn't you build a system of connections and people and a CRM and ways to talk about this stuff? And why not put all that together? Hell, you could even probably sell it online in a PDF or a package or a course, right? You could be one of those cats that doesn't do shit, but sells stuff to people on how to do shit. Uh, I've had to do it for my job, but I've heard some say you have nothing to go off of and others say without a doubt, do it. Oh, okay. Well, if your question is, should I negotiate my salary? I think that is something that you should probably ask in the interviewing process. 
especially when you get the offer. Hey, Freddie, this is Zane with Phoenix. Congratulations, we're going to make an offer. This is Engineering Staff 1. We're going to offer 62 k a year. It comes with a full benefit package we talked about. Freddie would say, awesome, dude, I greatly appreciate that. That's amazing. I've been impressed with you and your work, this whole situation. We've been through this, and I really appreciate your time and energy. I'm going to take some time to think about this. Can you let me know two things? Do I have a deadline for an answer? And is this negotiable? Are there items in here that we could talk through? Maybe that number or benefits or training or you maybe some of those kind of things. And let's see what they say. Now, you might end up like me. I had one company that when I asked that question in a slightly different form, they said, hey, we need you to negotiate. And so when I came in with my counter offer, they immediately pulled the job because they didn't think they could ever have me happy. And I'm like, you just told me to negotiate, and I did, and you pulled the offer. Like, what the hell? And it was cool, because that pretty much told me I didn't need to work at this place. If they're going to play games like that, you probably don't want to be there for a long period of time. Saying, what are your thoughts on working on a startup? Depends on what it is. So most of you guys are young, coming out of school. You've got to ask yourself, am I going to learn to do anything? Am I going to get experience? Am I going to make a name for myself? Am I going to make connections, right? And there's a lot of startups that are like, hey, man, we'll give you 5% if you work for free 200 hours a day. Well, you need to debate that, right? If it's the next Steve Jobs and you know it and he's known in the entire industry and you don't need money, fuck it. Take a shot at it. Go for it. Try it for six months. See what happens, right? On the flip side, if it's like most people who are blowhards and don't really have a product and, oh, man, if we can just get one-tenth of one percent of the market, we'll be billionaires, and they don't really have a solution or an answer to anything, and they want you to work for free or to be the technical guy in exchange for some shares that mean nothing, screw that, dude. Don't waste your time. Again, like I said, your sweet spot is probably the company that's gotten their Series A, Series B. They're making a name. Maybe they're getting some acquisition. People poking around to see if they should buy them. They've gotten through that second or third layer of people so they know how to communicate and pass their culture on. They've got cool projects that are well-funded. Maybe they got a monster customer that they're just spinning up. The, one of the companies I worked for before, um, one of the guys came in. They had just landed a contract with like 15 paper mills across the country and they had one office in Atlanta and they had to create an office in every single one of those locations. So those 15 dudes that went out and started those offices made a major move in that company. And a lot of them there are now, you know, major owners of this hundred billion, you know, hundred million dollar company now. Right. Back then it was an opportunity. It was a startup. It looked right. They had the right customer. They had like a five year contract. Hey, that's probably a pretty cool opportunity. Now, before that, if you'd gone 10 years before that, the dude was starting the company in his basement and had like one customer and he worked a full-time job. That's probably not the startup you want to start with right out of the gate, right? I think you got to weigh all the opportunities. The answer just keeps coming back, Freddie, to what is it you want to do and what gets you there the fastest. The other thing, let me go on and say this, because for all of us, you're never stuck and you didn't make a mistake, okay? You can go back down the path. You can stop and back up. It's okay. There is a reverse in the car and you can put it in R and you can back up and go back to the last fork and try again. If something doesn't work out, at some point, cut it off. Same thing as an engineer. If you're testing something and you just can't get the damn thing to work, at some point you stop the test because it's not going to work. And now you go back to the drawing board and come up with something different to do. Same thing with your career. If you get down there and company ownership changes or your boss changes or they lose their major customer, start looking for a job. You don't have to stay it out forever, right? We're in a different era than like my parents. My parents, if you left a job before three years, no one would hire you again for the rest of your life. And it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of, right? Nowadays, if somebody works somewhere for 45 minutes and they write up two pages about it on their LinkedIn, chat GPT talks about all the billions of things they did in the 90 days they worked at some company. Yeah, I guess that was going to be like, I guess I had a, I have a question on that. So let's say that... You get your first job and everything goes terrible. It sucks and you don't want to be there. You quit uh, and you want to go to another company. I, I don't know, like, is, are there companies now there nowadays that they don't care or like they, they don't mind that? Because I've seen questions. Well, you're going to have to be prepared to answer the question. Okay. 
we do it very often, the, the very second question we send in our email screening. You know, the first question is, what is your why? And the second is, hey, what happened at so-and-so? Maybe you could tell they either got laid off or fired because they're not with that company anymore and they've been looking for a month or two, right? You want to know what happened. And it's going to depend on what they answer, right? Oh, everybody there is an asshole and screw them. Yeah, that's probably not the person you want. Hey, they lost their biggest customer. I was the last guy to get hired. I was the first one to get laid off. I'm just looking for an opportunity. I'm ready to keep talking to you. It just kind of depends. Also, let's say you're in an interview with the owner of a company about my size and he's passionate, talks about business and doing things that are important in his life because you studied all his YouTube and you went through his LinkedIn and you, you, know, you subscribed to his channels and all that kind of stuff, right? And you quit your last job because the culture blew ass and he's a big culture guy. Well, say that in your answer. Hey, I was at a place and the culture didn't fit. I didn't feel like I could provide value. I didn't feel like they were a good fit for me and it didn't go together. And I didn't want it to go on any longer than it needed because I want to be providing value wherever I'm at. Damn, that just hit pretty good. Let's see. Alex said, I know you mentioned Tony Robbins training to spend the money. It's worth it. But for courses like that in general, how are you deciphering between a BS offer and an actual course that will bring you valuable content to go out and apply to then learn it? All right. Oh, good one. Thank you for the soft toss, Alex. All right, here we go. You can learn something in everything that you do. So no matter how terrible the course or terrible the class or bad the instructor or terrible the content, you can learn something. Okay, You might learn to never buy a course from that company again. You might learn to never take a class from that instructor again. But you did learn something. You need to quit living in fear of wasting your money and begin living in fear of wasting your time. Because if you don't take that course, where are you going to be? If you don't get that information, where are you going to be? What if you could pay some money and learn something that's with you for the rest of your life and no one can ever take away from you, and it's the one thing that gets you to be successful? Why wouldn't you buy those lottery tickets? What was it recently? The lottery was $2 billion. You really needed a ticket to win it. Now, the chances of winning it were really low, but you needed to make sure you had a ticket. So again, same thing with training. It's not always going to be great. It's not always going to be perfect. And it's not always what you need right then. But if you took really good notes, you can come back to it later. There's something you can pull out of it. Maybe it's you just met a guy there that ends up hiring you, right? You can get something out of every course. Now, I think if you study people right now that are out here putting out a lot of content, Grant Cardone, Andy Frisella, a bunch of people that are on YouTube putting out content, a lot of them will tell you spend the first $10,000 that you make and put in your investment fund, spend it on yourself. Whether it's Toastmasters or a course or going to a training or hiring a coach or something, invest in yourself. Here's the thing. Early in your career, that information, that connection, those people, that knowledge, you will have it the rest of your life. So you will get return on it over and over and over and over again. And it's a hell of a lot better than putting 10K in an S&P ETF and making 5%. Because surely I can make more than 5% on 10 grand on 10 grand of knowledge in my career. What if it gets me an extra 25K a year from now on? What if it gets me into a connection for a company that I get in there on the startup and I get 25% of the shares and we sell it for $100 million? How do you detect between BS and, and the other? Tony Robbins has been around for how many years now? Probably something to it. Freddie's been on YouTube for what, like four minutes? So I probably wouldn't take a course from Freddie. Tony's been doing it for 30 more or more years now. And a lot of people vouch for him. I mean, I just vouched for him, right? So somebody that's already done what you're trying to do tells you to take a course from somebody. You don't need to decipher if it's BS anymore. Just take the damn course. And you know what? Don't then email them and tell them how bad the course was and how much it sucked. Maybe you weren't ready for it. Maybe you didn't get out of it what you should have, right? Because, again, you can always learn something from everyone and everything. But let's expand on this a little bit more, okay? When you are beginning your career, one of the most important things you can do for your overall life from now on is to pay yourself first, okay? When you get your check... Do you actually get all your money initially? Or did someone already take some of your money? What do you say, Freddie? Keep it on those things, you know, 401k stuff. Uh... Well, that's for you. But there's other people that come and take money before you even get to see it, right? Don't taxes come out? Like, they don't even trust you to pay your taxes. They take all the money before you even get your check. Before it shows up in your bank account, the government's got their money from you. 
okay, well, if they can get their money first, why can't you get yours? Aren't you more important to yourself? So what most people do is they buy a bunch of stupid shit, and then at the end of the month, whatever's left, they put in their savings, okay? That means they're going to be sheep and do what they're told the rest of their life. People who know what's going on will, as soon as they get their check, they will take a chunk and they will pay themselves first into a separate account. They will move it immediately, 10, 20, 30%, whatever you can live on. You don't need to buy a car when you first get out of college, okay? You don't need it. Buy some old hump, leap, take a job where you can ride the train to work, whatever. Take that money and put it in your investment account. And then it doesn't come out for any reason other than investing. It's not savings for a down payment on a house. It's not savings to go on a trip to France. It's investments. Now, what should your first investments be? We just talked about it. Your first 10K should be into making you better at whatever it is you're trying to do. After that, start in simple S&P index funds, right? Until you start to get better. Right now, you need to be honing your knowledge on your career and your technical training and being a great engineer. And then eventually, when you have a shit ton of money to invest, you can learn more about money. You can learn about investing in companies and doing all kinds of options and all kinds of other crazy stuff. In the meantime, slap it over into a dividend fund and just collect your checks and let the, those account balances start to, to build up. Because at some point, you'll have a nice chunk of change and then you can buy a company or start a company or invest in something big. But again, pay yourself first or you will never change anything. The only way out of this rat race and this trap and being a sheep is to pay yourself first. Okay, that's the only way out. Otherwise, you will be poor, destitute, and living paycheck to paycheck for the rest of your life. And how many people see their parents doing it right now? Right? Struggling, can barely pay the bills, don't know how they're going to afford college or a wedding, shit tons of credit card, they're stressed out all the time, their job sucks, and they can't leave because they got to pay all these bills. Why? Because when they started and fresh got out of school and got their first job, they spent their paycheck instead of paying themselves first into their investment account. Right? 10K a year for 10 years, that's a lot more money than your parents probably even have. And they've been at it for 30 years. Can you give a, a rundown again of like the steps? Like, Because right now, I know Alex and I, and I think Natalie is going to graduate this semester too. So, like you said, brief rundown. All right. So, when you're looking at your job offers, so you're living, some of you guys are in Atlanta, the cost of living and about what it takes to live here, even with some roommates and shit like that. When you're negotiating these job offers and looking at all these different opportunities, one thing you need to look at is the cost of living difference in the places that your jobs are. If it's downtown Los Angeles and it's the same amount of pay as Atlanta, you're taking a, what, like 30% pay cut to move there? So you need to know what it costs to live in the area and make sure that you have at least that amount of money in that offer. Because it would be dumb to go somewhere and try to work for the first five years and be at negative 5K a year before you even start, right? If you know it takes an average of 70K to live in Atlanta and you take a job for 68, you're going to struggle. Right. So you need to know those things going in, try to get you 80. And then that 12K goes into you and investments. It doesn't go into anything else. Okay. It's not to buy a car or, oh, instead of living with a roommate, I'm going to have my own apartment, in some fancy place. Oh, I'm going to buy thousands of dollars of clothes. Oh, I'm going to take trips, all that. Screw all that. The first part of your career and the first part of your life when you start working should be building up your machine because the faster you can get money in it, the more it can work for you. And compounding interest is the greatest thing in the history of the world. Okay. So as much as you can possibly take off the top and hell eat ramen noodles your first year, who cares? You've been doing it in college, right? It's not time to eat steak yet, right? Wait a few years, and then you can have really good steaks. You can have two and three hundred dollar steaks like I have instead of going to Ryan's Steakhouse for twelve dollars. Okay, put it into yourself as much as you possibly can. If there's any way to not spend money, it goes into your investment account, not savings. You're not saving money; you're investing money. Okay, that's how you get out. Okay, so as much as you can possibly get in there. Now, a couple of things: if you have a company that matches four hundred one k and you have a decently high salary in a state that might have high taxes, let's say you get a job in California, right? Great pay, high taxes, okay? 401k is gonna take the money out pre-tax and then they're gonna match a portion of it, which is basically like getting a little bit more pay. 
So if they match, if you can put in 5% and they match dollar for dollar 5%, well, you just made 5% more money on that offer. So you can factor that in when you're comparing jobs. And now you're getting 10% of your salary in your 401k that you can't touch, and that's cool because that's going to grow for you, okay? Now, of what's left, your take-home, live on the minimum, man. Find a way to chunk off 20% and put it in that investment account. The more you can put in, the faster. If you can live with mom and dad for another year and they don't want to kill you, take all of that money that you would pay for rent and put it in your investment account. Go ahead and cut the check, so to speak. Go ahead and move the money and pretend like it's an expense and put it over there. I know a lot of parents that actually do that. That's one of the things we were doing with um, our uh, daughter for a while. We charged her rent to have a room in the house, but we're putting it in an account so that when she graduates college, we're going to give it back to her. So she's used to paying it. So now when she's ready to move out on her own and get roommates, she's already used to that expense. She's already budgeted for it. But we took it away from her so she wouldn't spend it and put it in her investment account. You should do that to yourself. And what if if you don't know in what to invest it? Like, let's say you get your current job, like to get more experience than that. But you let's say that course is like 200 and you've been saving like, let's uh, just say like 2000. Like, did you just keep it stacking that up and stacking that? Here's the thing. You want it to give you ROI, return on investment. All right. What are up at my money, Zane? There's 10,000 YouTube videos to confuse you on all that kind of stuff. The easy routes, I would set up a Vanguard or Fidelity or one of the, you know, Swab or one of the free brokers. I'd set up an account because they normally have, when you sweep your money in, it's in a money market. It's paying 5 or 6% right now. And then you can move it into, you know, standard S&P 500 type index fund right super low cost you don't pay a lot of money for people managing it and they just invest in the stock market the general overall you pick whatever it is stock market another thing you do is just start buying dividend stock for me one of the things my wife wants to do is move to Mexico and hang out. We know about what it's going to cost to live in the town she wants to live in. So what I did is I took a certain, paid myself first out of my company and my salary that I make here, and I put it into a Fidelity account, and I bought all dividend stocks. And how did I pick them? found some dude on YouTube that I liked what he was doing and how he analyzed shit, so I just do what he does. And that way I don't have to think about it. I can go make more money. Right. I don't waste my time learning how to invest money. I go make money in what I'm really good at. And then I find people to listen to that know how to invest money. And then I just borrow from them and see how it works. Right. So anyway, I've built up a dividend portfolio that pays me yearly dividends, which are going to cover. I could leave right now and live in Mexico with the wife. And I've got enough money to pay for that for the rest of my life because I invested and moved the money over there. Again, it's what is it you want to do and how do you get there as fast as possible? What do I need to invest in? Well, if you don't know, shove it into a money market account paying you five or six percent until you do know and then schedule an hour a week to watch youtube videos on how to invest your money and then listen to a whole bunch of people and make a decision what's warren buffett tell you to do just buy index funds okay he's got a lot of money i'd listen to him before i listen to your dad who's broke as shit that's another thing don't ever tell your family you're about to invest money do not never do not ask unless your family is rich or business people or has a lot of money do not even mention you're saving money because they will all have opinions and they're all wrong you want opinions on what to do with money and how to invest it every poor person on earth will tell you for hours what you should and shouldn't do and how the hell would they know because they're not doing it they're just parroting crap they've heard it's back to engineering. If you want to learn how to do something in engineering, you go find somebody that's doing it and you talk to them. Same thing. If you want to invest and make a lot of money, find some people that invest. Join a club, join an investment club where five or six people get together and talk about investments. That way, once a week, you're talking about it and you're figuring out what to do and you're learning. And I guess this is a follow up question because, you know, you see out there it's, uh, totally different shit of people, a lot of talking about different investments. Some people saying that don't do SAP stuff, like don't do this shit because you're, it doesn't work or start the own business and invest on in that business. What are your thoughts about all the people that there's people that are always going to be yeah, do this uh, SAP or don't do this SAP because, you know, it's a system and you get tricked by that. Or there are people that have been successful in that, but I don't, like, when do you see that it's a scam or not? The best way to answer this question, it's back to what we were talking about a minute ago. You can learn something from everything. And as an engineer, one of the things you're taught is to mitigate risk. 
to build safety and to have a factor of safety. Okay. So that's basically what you want to do. It, and it's back to what we were talking about a minute ago. Never tell your family you're investing money because you'll have 10 K that you put back, but your uncle Leon is starting a restaurant. And if you love your uncle, you'll invest with his restaurant and then all your money's gone. Really, really good book. Richest man in Babylon. Okay. Quick read. You can read it in a night. Richest man in Babylon. Get the book, read it. It talks about this over and over and over again with clear examples of what you just asked me. Go for it. Check it out. Great book. Absolutely amazing. Buy 100 copies for your whole family. Hand it out to kids. It's great. But again, remember who you're talking to and where you're getting advice from. Okay. If it's Leroy on YouTube, it's got 1200 followers and you can't find him anywhere else on earth and he doesn't own shit in real estate and he's selling you in a real estate investment course you know what you're probably going to get if it's a dollar hell get it put it in chat gpt and have it summarize it right maybe you get something out of it don't be scared to invest in those things but also mitigate the risk like why would you take ten thousand dollars and go to the casino and put it on black and have a 48 percent chance of doubling your money probably not your best investment strategy if that's your last ten thousand dollars on earth but if you could put that into a ten thousand dollar tony robbins course who's been doing this for a hundred years and has thousands of people that have vouched for him and made millions listening to him that's probably a pretty good investment again you're an engineer mitigate the risk create a factor of safety Find a way to try it out without doing it, that kind of stuff. Another one that you could do, especially early in your career, is have $100 a month that you have to invest in bullshit. And you'll learn very, like, when my kids were little, we bought them a little company that was on Amazon that sold soap. And they were making about hundred grand a year when they were like seven, eight years old. Okay, And one of the things I did, first they had to put money in their investment account. But then after they paid themselves, I made them spend a certain amount of money. They had to spend it. They had to buy shit. And it was a chunk of change, right? And like my youngest son, who's now a senior in high school, he has this hat that he still hates more than anything on earth because he paid like 120 bucks for this hat. And so he doesn't want to take it outside and wear it and get it dirty because it's an expensive hat. But he sees it on his shelf and it just reminds him of the money he wasted. And it's helped him in decisions later in life. So that's what I'm getting at is get some experience. Take $100 a month and waste it on some stupid ass programs. And you'll learn really quickly which ones make sense and which don't. And you'll start to learn which ones to stay away from and which ones to try out. And every once in a while you might hit a lottery ticket where you get a $100 course that makes you $100,000. So again, don't be afraid. Because the thing is that $100, you didn't waste it. You spent it learning. You spent learning that, oh, I shouldn't invest in those kind of people. Right? And wouldn't you rather invest a hundred dollars and find out they're not good and invest ten thousand dollars and find out they're not good right 